This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Cyber Frontier, show number 55, recorded on April 29th, 2019. Here on Cyber Frontiers, we explore uh, cybersecurity, big data, and the technologies that are shaping the future. If you have questions, comments, or contributions, and we do have an email contribution tonight that we're going to do, you can send those to us, jim at theaverageguy.tv. You can copy and really just make sure Christian's on it. I mean, I, I, I don't really need to read it. But uh, you send it to Christian, Christian at theaverageguy.tv. You can find me on Twitter, at Jay Collison, and Christian is at Borg Whisper. Don't forget the average guy.tv platform, both web and media hosting, powered by Maple Grove Partners. Get secure, reliable, high speed hosting from people that you know and you trust. Plans start as little as $10. They're WordPress optimized. They're great for podcasters. They're great for anybody. And of course, Christian will work with you on that. For more information, head over to maplegrovepartners.com. And if you, have, if you haven't subscribed yet, maybe it's time to resubscribe. We are on again, off again on this thing so much. Maybe it's dropped off. So if you're listening to this, you've never subscribed. Head out there, whatever podcast player you're in, and get it subscribed. Christian's back with us tonight. Christian, it's been about 45 days since I've seen you. What, uh, well, welcome back, and what's been yeah. keeping you busy? Thanks. Uh, the usual cascading effect of like work melding in and out of holiday schedule has me uh, all discombobulated last month, but we're rocking and rolling, and uh, on to spring. I feel like when our last show, it was like, we were, we were peeling off the layers of winter and getting to sp spring. Mm -hmm. Now, now we're in full swing of mm -hmm. um, allergy season and uh, warmth and abundant amounts of pollen. So uh, maybe instead of uh, data being the new bacon, pollen is the new bacon because <laughs> it's everywhere, man. It's crushing me. I've been doing some crypto work, and uh, that hasn't that hasn't ended. By the way, maybe we can talk about that towards the end of the show. And um, but I've been finding myself inside a lot and I keep it's like, man, I got to get outside. Like it has been beautiful. And uh, so if you're here in the Northern hemisphere and uh, spring is well on its way, summer will be here before you know it. Uh, every once in a while, take a break and go outside. Just get yourself break away from that computer, but not, not tonight or not while you're listening to the podcast. Exactly. We've got some stuff to cover. I mentioned it in the, in the beginning of the show, we did get some listener feedback. Christian, why don't you, uh, well, and by the way, it, we'd love to have your emails, Jim at TheAverageGuy.tv or Christian at TheAverageGuy.tv. Send in your questions. Christian, love those. He's going to read this email to you. Yeah, so this is an email from one of our listeners, uh, Kelly, out there. Thank you for uh, sending this my way. So um, she described a situation where um, a friend had recommended a site to her called uh, HaveIBeenPwned.com. Um, and the site kind of claims to, you know, check your email, check your username and see if you've been compromised in a data breach before. Um, she puts her information into the site and lo and behold, uh, she gets several results that are kind of like, huh, that's disconcerting. I didn't even know that I was a subject of some of those breaches and disclosures. And, you know, here's this huge list. Um, and the question was really geared uh, twofold, kind of number one, uh, is the site legitimate? Uh, fair question to ask. Um, and two, if the site's accurate and it's legitimate, um, what can I do to mitigate the damage? So um, the obvious thing that kind of popped out was, you know, changing my passwords, doing those right things. But are there other things I should be considering around uh, closing accounts or um, kind of cleaning up things that are haven't been used in maybe a long time? Um, or maybe should I even be submitting uh, information requests to these companies, asking them to delete my profile and my information? Uh, so all really great questions. Uh, so I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about this site. I believe, I didn't do my own homework, that we covered this, sh this site somewhere in some show in the Cyber Frontiers pedagogy. Um, where, though, I haven't the faintest idea. Um, so I'm glad we brought it back up to the top of the stack. Uh, the site is, in fact, legitimate. It's accurate. Um, and it was a project that was started by Troy Hunt, who's one of the uh, well-known InfoSec professionals in uh, kind of the Microsoft MVP community. So he started the site when the first major breach happened with Adobe because uh, he's kind of fascinated by the concept of, well, who really is getting um, impacted by this? And obviously... 
We've talked numerous times about uh, the onslaught of subsequent data breaches that have taken place since Adobe. Um, and so he really has a lot of cool features in the site. The, the idea of the site itself is that it's kind of acting, number one, as a journal of here are all the breaches, here are all the disclosures. Uh, but what he's doing is he's actually aggregating all of the databases and data and actual content that's getting breached. So a lot of times what happens is you might get a notice that you've been part of a data breach, or you may not get a notice, or you may not find the notice, whatever. But by and, by and large, just because a breach happens doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to have the tech savvy to go out there into the dark web and find where the data was leaked, where your info was lost, et cetera. Um, so what he's doing here, which is really quite cool, is creating an aggregated database across all of the data uh, based breaches that that he has access to um, and giving a, a both an API and a web interface to kind of query your email and see across all of the known breaches and disclosures, have you been impacted by any of them? Um, and so he ends up more or less having to get copies of these data sets and or other sources that reveal that login information in order to create this huge repository of information. Um, when I mean huge, I mean across 362 owned websites that have had a breach. That represents over 7.8 billion um, compromised accounts, about 95,000 pastes, and about 114 million pasted account data. So really like a massive database for what is really like a pretty small data set in one respect, which is we're only talking about 362 websites and that comprises um, that nearly 8 billion figure for pwned accounts. So really fascinating on the surface of it that that's that's how quickly we're, we're scaling and talking about um, account disclosures. Um, he also maintains an RSS feed that's kind of showing the recently added breaches that they're doing in real time with the exact statistics. So if for nothing else, it's a very interesting data source to find out what are the breaches that are going on. Because if I go and read this RSS feed, there's a lot of breaches that I'm not aware of that have happened that are kind of like the smaller to medium sized fishes that, you know, it's not like, a, oh, LinkedIn got breached and everyone's going to know about that, right? It's more like something maybe more minor got breached, like a form site um, or a photo site, whatever it is. Uh, but this really has a pretty complete all-in-one place to find out about data breach and disclosure information. Um, so it raises a couple interesting questions. One is, should I be concerned if I put my email in here and stuff comes back? Well, short answer is, of course you should be. It really comes down to, are these things you knew about beforehand, um, number one. Number two, have you seen any strange account activity or other activities since? If, if not, great, but maybe that's also an indicator that you just haven't logged in your account in a while to see that hmm, maybe something's not right. Um, and on the flip side of that, you know, one of the features that the website offers is to um, actually be removed from the database if you don't want to be listed, right? So maybe an adversary who's out to get me as a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing knows my email address and is going to look up my email address in this database, see that I have an account with LinkedIn and that it was breached. And because he wants to do reputational damage to me, he's going to use this database to to figure out that I do have a compromised account on the internet. And then all he has to do is go and find that data set. Um, there is some responsibility aspects of the website itself. Number one, it's not like if I type in my email or anyone else's email, it's going to tell me the password that was associated with that breach or that disclosure, right? So we're not, there, there are no raw data sets being offered or surfaced through this site. They're merely aggregating that key lookup of your username slash email field to let you know whether or not you're part of a breach data set. And if so, which breach you're a part of. Um, it's not telling you here's the compromised info associated with that breach. Um, 
the flip side of that is that if you didn't ever take action and it is some a, a data dump that's still out there, then I potentially could use this site if I knew what email or what logins you were under to, to identify where you would have accounts that are still vulnerable. And then I could continue on my journey kind of looking for those exploits on my own. The other mitigating factor here though, is that like this is easier for junior level fishes in the hacker world, right? So what I mean by that is if you're impacted by a data breach, any professional hacker that wants to go after you is gonna have all those raw data sets or is going to get them, right? They're not gonna necessarily go through this website. So this might kind of, if you're concerned about being listed here, it might remove some of the lower tier fish, so to speak, from um, getting more insights into where you might have problems in your own perimeter defense, for lack of a better word. Um, the other cool feature on this site is a section on the compromised passwords, and they have a database of over 550 million real world passwords that were previously exposed in data breaches um, and makes them pretty much unsuitable to ever reuse again. Why? Because every hacker is going to have a dictionary attack for every login service that has this list of 551 million passwords in it. Uh, because chances are you reuse that password elsewhere or they're common passwords shared by many. Um, and so to test that theory, um, we can put any password in the world that we want to test into this website and it'll tell us how many times it showed up in a related data breach associated with an account. For example, if I put ABC123 as a password in, which great password, by the way, 100% recommend it, snork. Um, 2.8 million times this password has been seen just within the breach data set that's available, right? So clear example of um, if you're using regular dictionary words, if you're using kind of the simple keyboard skirting from left to right, anything like that, you're probably definitely, your your, your password is, is in, represented in these data sets in one way or another. Um, maybe you somehow got super lucky and happy to be using a service that didn't get compromised, but you're using this kind of password with, um, again, um, there's lots of password generators and other things that can help you not be stupid here. Um, the takeaway though was what should I really do about this site? Like what's the response as the average guy, if I go here, well, I guess there's a couple branches. In one case, you could type your login in and nothing shows up. And that's a great day for you. You should feel good about yourself. Um, the less uh, sunny day scenario is you type in your login and one or more things come back. Um, I kind of like to talk about it as peeling layers of the onion. So the most obvious layer to peel is first, have you changed your password since the breach occurred? Uh, if the answer is no, go do that. If the answer is yes, you should ask yourself the question, how often are my passwords rotating? Um, maybe it's been over two years since you've uh, changed a password associated with that service. Maybe this is now a good time to go update and pick a new random password in that service listing. Um, the other side of that coin, which was brought up by the listeners that, you know, what if I haven't used this account in four years? Like, should I really keep it out there? And I like to, to draw this back to my time and true advice on this show, which is reduce your surface area. Um, this is a classic example of reducing your surface area with minimum effort. If you don't use a service anymore and the service allows you to close your account, close your account. The barrier to entry to reopen that account if you need it someday in the future, very low. Um, so you should, you should feel empowered to delete frequently and often. Um, it is much harder to remove persistent information um, than it is to basically let it flap out into the open for long periods of time um, and keep paying the the dues, so to speak, associated with leaving that persistent information out on the internet. Um, that's not to say that it won't persist in some shape or form, but at least by deleting the account, A, you're not continuing to add new data or metadata going forward directly or indirectly with the service, and two, um, 
you're reducing your ability to have reputational harm directly or indirectly, right? So it might not necessarily be directly the fact that someone can take advantage of money in a bank account or post on your behalf, but it might be some of those more indirect things of um, how is it a stepping stone to other accounts and services? How is it a launch point to impersonate someone? There's other ways that those accounts and credentials can be used that seem very far removed from the original intent and purpose of that account in and of itself. So by and large, feel empowered to delete and, and scrub out liberally. Um, the third point though is like, don't freak out. Chances are, um, if you haven't used this site before, you don't track data breaches quite frequently, and you haven't seen anomalous activity, either you're not special enough that people care about you, um, or you've taken some of the mitigative steps that we've already talked about. Um, if you're still in this listing and it's stuff that you maybe haven't addressed, just go take care of it, right? Um, you probably don't need to do this extensive post-mortem analysis on how you got to the state because the reality is you got to the state because the provider you put your trust in um, failed to uphold their end of the deal. Um, so that's just kind of the premise of what we're talking about here to begin with. I think it's um, wise for the average guy to be continuing to track these things and track these accounts. And there's kind of a couple of ways to do that. One, you can read about what breaches are going on and that's all well and good. But two, um, you know, I'm a data guy. So I like to think about what are all the metrics that applications should be able to collect to help me be more secure. And this is one of those things for any password manager company that is out there. Um, here's a feature I'd love and maybe it's there and I just have missed it. I don't know. Um, but tell me, uh, write me some feedback if, if I'm, if I'm wrong in this statement, but it would be fantastic if for every single login in my password manager, my password manager told me in no uncertain terms, Hey, here is the last time you used this credential to log in through the password manager. Then it would only be a matter of doing a simple sort from A to Z of like, huh, here's the, here are the most recent ones I've used and here are the oldest ones I've used. And then maybe every six months as good cyber hygiene, I would take the top 10 least frequently used logins and revisit those sites to see, do I still need it? Have I changed my password lately, et cetera. And I feel like, well, password managers give us a really good scope and lens into changing passwords quickly and rotating. I don't know if the metrics are really there in some of these, certainly uh, with RoboForm, which continues to be actively developed, actively maintained. I get new releases all the time. I have the professional version, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's no obvious metrics or data that scream out to me when I look at my list of logins that tell me, hey, here was the last time you tried to use this login with something, right? Um, if I wanted to know when a login was created, I suppose I could go on my computer's file system and see when the record was created, but A, that's not really a friendly customer experience, and B, that only tells me a small part of the puzzle, right? Like, when did I first use this account? It would be fantastic if companies gave customers more power in the tooling to do that type of analysis on their own. So I suppose that's my one piece of feedback from it all. Um, but what can you do in the absence of that? You can really just kind of, again, you know, I'm a pretty big power user. I would say I probably have a couple hundred accounts total around a variety of different things. And, you know, probably at least 20 to 30% are things that I could go back and start cleaning up. Right. Um, I think everyone is somewhat in that boat. Um, in the absence of those metrics, maybe just kind of do it random scattergun theory with stuff that you kind of look at and you go, hmm, haven't used that in a while, or hmm, I don't even know what that is. Whereas like, if it's your Facebook account, you're probably logging into it however frequently. Don't use Facebook, by the way. Uh, that was a terrible example. Let's try again. Um, you're using your, uh, I don't know, your Pinterest account. And, um, you know, you're probably checking your Pinterest boards every two weeks for the, the greatest uh, wineries and, um and dinner recipes, right? And you don't want to miss out on those latest updates from Chef Boyardee, right? Okay, then probably you don't really need to worry about that as much. You just kind of 
filtered out of your head and even changing the password on these sites is starting to become lesser relevant to do on a frequent basis if you have the two-factor hardware tokens that you're starting to use with a lot of these services so you know by and large i'm amazed that we still have password conversations in 2019 to this depth and scope but it also amazes me that we don't provide analytics in our password manager tools for customers. So pretty fascinating. Uh, don't forget. So there is a security challenge built into LastPass where you could go in, proactively start it. It'll tell you all those. It'll give you all those stats. Hey, you've got this many accounts that have this many. I'm sure some of the other ones have that as well, right? Yeah, I just I just found it, actually. So yeah. you can scratch the yeah. last 10 minutes of my screen. No, 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 no. I actually, a... I do think your idea about it being proactive would be great. In other words, and I'm notorious for this, I kind of yeah. have a general one I use for new accounts. And then if I'm going to keep the if I'm going to keep the account, I'll then go mm -hmm. back and change it. Right. Although I haven't been as good about going back and changing that as, as I could. Um. And so it gives me, I would love for it to go, okay, don't use that account. Cause it, it actually, the, the password that I sometimes use for the, the easy one to remember when I'm starting new things is on mm -hmm. the pwned list. Like, so when I went to the password things, it's there, it's been seen one time. So it's not like it's gigantic, but it's still sure. on the pwned list, right? Four of my email accounts are on the pwned list Four that I use quite frequently now. They've been on there. My Yahoo address is on 18 different pwned lists, right? That makes sense. Yahoo, and that's my oldest email account, and I use it for spam stuff. So it doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, kind of make sense. Two factor is turned on on all of those, right? We've been we've been kind of through that before where it's like, okay, can't really trust passwords. Better make sure everything's locked down with two factor. Sure. And so, uh, so I feel pretty good about that. They all alert me when I try to, sometimes it's impossible for me to get into my own email addresses because there's all these things I need to approve and like, okay, now which two factor did I set up for that one and this one and, you know, those types of things. But, um, so there are, but I would like it, Christian, to remind me in real time, I'm putting this thing in, oh, oh that's on the pwn list. You might not want to use that or you've used it before. Pick something at least right. a little bit different, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. going to remember it anyways. That's the yeah. that's the that's the fallacy. Like I need to stop doing that because I can just go to LastPass, generate a password, and be done with it. I don't know why I still choose a startup password. It's just a habit, right? It's it's sure. a bad habit. One I need to stop. Sure. Yeah. So in the case of Roboform, there's this tab called Security Center. I've never seen it before. This goes to the whole customer experience deal, yeah. and it gives you. The name of the login uh, shows the password length. It gives you your password strength, and then it gives you the age. Um, so you can sort by age or by the strength of the password to kind of do that hygiene exercise that I'd been talking mm -hmm. about. Um, <laughs> amazing is just to see, like, and I think most listeners, if they have been on the internet for at least a decade, you'll find that well over half of your logins you haven't used in, in over a year easily. Um, and there's probably your 10 to 15 or so go-tos that are your go-to logins. And after that, man, it's a lot of crud. <laughs> um, and again, it probably depends on how much of a power user you are, but um, yeah. By the way, awesome sauce used 907 times as a password. So awesome sauce. You might not want to use awesome sauce. I've never used that, but that would that may be one of those where somebody would actually try and use it. Yeah, yeah it's a really good site. Yeah, this is yeah, you know, not yeah. very solid. Um, and I, like I said, I think it's helpful if you want to do this exercise on a, you know, even an annual basis, probably. Uh, I think. I started using LastPass to just kind of keep track of all my accounts. Like, because, you know, with the LastPass plugin, I'm sure one password and Robo, I'm sure they've got these two. Um, every time I sign up for a new account, it says, hey, do you want me to remember this? And I'm like, heck yeah, because I need to be able to get back to this thing. Yeah. And so at least I have a record. And then, of course, I can run that um, security check to say, okay, how many of those? I have a bunch with all the same password. I need. It's that time of the year again. It's like, all right. I need to sit down on a Saturday, clean all that up, assign new passwords. And like you said, it's probably time to shut some of those down. You know, I'm like, okay, this is this is pretty dumb. 
The other thing I need to do, Christian, is I need to move my two-factor from, and I think I've been using Google, but LastPass has one and they keep track of those in case the phone gets wiped out. You've got a backup of it and it'll restore it. To me, that seems a little bit smarter of a way to do it, especially in a world where phones slip out of people's hands and land in rivers and things mm -hmm. like that, you know? Uh, so, you know, it, it, to me, it would, I, I, but to do that, you have to go to the site, turn it off, <laughs> turn it back on and use the new, you know, use the new two factor method to get it done. So it takes a little bit of time. That's the, the drawback. You might spend a couple hours. I have 469 accounts on LastPass. Now, some of those are work related and, you know, some, they're not yeah. all personal, but there's, we have a lot of accounts these days. Yeah, and I think it it, it kind of makes you think that the Europeans aren't as crazy as as one might think when it comes to how stringent their privacy laws are getting. In the sense that um, the right to be forgotten really actually promotes going and deleting these inactive accounts and just getting that data out. Um, and having that mechanism is pretty helpful when you're trying to do this kind of thing. We used to have Amber Gott on Home Gadget Geeks when she worked for LastPass, and they were on every six months or so. And that was actually a good, they would scare the bejesus out of me every time they were on, kind of like you're scaring the bejesus out of me right now. I, you started talking about, it's like, oh, crap, I haven't had LastPass on in a year. I haven't done that, the security checkup in a year. Mm -hmm. And it's a probably, a, and that may be one of those things, another, you know, you talk about good things you could do. It would be pretty awesome to get an email from LastPass, you know, about every six months and go, hey, <laughs> you now have 50 or more passwords that are the same. It's time to start doing some work right on, on that on that deal. So that may be proactive and helpful as well. Yeah, no, right on. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, this whole idea and concept kind of brought me to another different but related idea, which was firmware security. And the reason I thought of it is because, you know, as the number of devices in our home are increasing, Internet of Things world, and, uh, you know, I think it's, I think 2019 is a year for like really cheap, accessible Internet of Things technology, right? Like you can go pick up a wise cam for 25 bucks and have your own, IP camera in your house, that's never been offered at that kind of price point with those types of features before, right? You can put sensors on your door for 10, 15 bucks. You can put smart plugs in for 15 bucks on Amazon. You can go get Echo Dots for 25 bucks, right? A lot of this um, trend that I'm starting to see is not just the fact that we're doing Internet of Things, but that the economics of Internet of Things have dramatically changed in 2019 and has really gotten very affordable. Um, you know, even on upper end Internet of Things, like thermostat controllers are not as expensive as what they would have been two years ago, right? Um, and so it's kind of putting fuel on the fire of we have all these random devices that have IP addresses. And one of the things that I think we constantly lose sight of because we have lives, we live them, you know, our full-time job is not information security for the home, um, is this notion that these vendors are pushing out firmware updates for these devices like once a month. Um, and there's nothing that's nagging you or telling you like, hey, there's this new firmware update unless you log in and you're using the device. Like what's a classic example? Here's a classic example. Classic example is you buy a Wi-Fi range extender because you want to increase the Wi-Fi range in your house. Great. Well, once you get that extender set up and working the way you want it to, you're probably not going to touch it again. Unless you change the base station or your wireless SSID or whatever, it's, it's very much advertised to you and marketed to you as a set it and forget it device. Meanwhile, you know, six months go by and five new releases of the of the firmware have come out and several of them contain critical security uh, releases. And you have really no way of knowing that. Why? Number one, 90% of us skip the registration process when we get a new device because we don't want the extra spam. Um, so the company doesn't have a regular way of communicating with you. Um, number two, you're probably not actively subscribed to daily reading on some knowledge base article on your favorite vendor's site telling you that this new version came out. 
Um, and so it kind of inspired a little bit of the, what does the product think around internet of things, firmware security for the average guy. And, you know, a lot of this stuff exists in the enterprise in terms of, I can do a lot of scanning and find a lot of things, but I have not seen to date, um, a comprehensive free or affordable, um, intuitive service, whether it's online or an offline installer or whatever that scans your home network and shows you all of your internet of things devices within that home network and lists the current versions of that firmware, if it can detect it and the latest version that's available. And like, there's a lot of these things that exist piecemeal for one vendor at a time, but there's no one that has really attempted to take a stab at aggregating those informations for all the common internet of things vendors and doing that level of regular detection in the house to see, Hey, are things falling out of drift? Um, and if you think about the economics question I went to earlier, it seems like the sweet spot for what the average American is willing to pay for an IOT device is somewhere between 20 and $50. So if the security solution costs you more than 20 to $50, probably no one's going to buy it. Right. But whatever that company is, that's in that sweet spot, of like for, for, for 20 bucks, you get this little thing that sits in your house and it just scans your network for your IOT devices and checks the firmware updates and checks the attempts on them. Um, I think that's going to become super pervasive and or important as these devices continue to hit the economics of opportunity that we're seeing with them. Um, and I'm not seeing the solution space in the home yet. Uh, obviously it's in the enterprise, it's in large scale, uh, intranets and wide area networks, et cetera. But, um, specifically to home users and specifically to these micro devices, I just don't see it. There, one possible solution, I'm using it now, is this Bitdefender box. Mm -hmm. And it, it does do a security scan of the network. It does tell me, it told me I had one of those little uh, WRT devices that had, you know, that was the firmware had was not being updated and it was out. It, it had a problem. It did flag me and go, hey, that thing's not secure. What it didn't do is it didn't tell me what or how if I could update it. You know, it didn't, it right. wasn't, it didn't necessarily make that easy. Now, you know, that, that, that may be infinitely more complicated than just telling me, but that's really the only device I've seen and I haven't tested them all. So I don't know, but I have been Christian that that's an area I've been concerned about. And I, I wanted, I do want a single device kind of a gateway here that is plug and play. And the Bit Defender box is fairly average guy, lock it down, comes, you know, the $99 plan a year. Come, now it's not in your price range, but that yep. you're saying, but at a hundred dollars a year, unlimited antivirus, unlimited internet security for your PCs. And you know, they are, a Bit Defender is making a run at this. So that may be the one exception to it. Is it wildly popular? No. Like nobody's talking about it but me for yeah. the most part, right? Um, it, it has just been, it has not a lot of, well, let's be honest. A lot of the enthusiasts that listen to me and my shows are probably building their own solutions, just to be 100% honest, you know? And like, what do you, what, how do you protect your, your, your endpoints there? What, what's, what's your strategy? Yeah, for me, a lot of it is I know what my, common vendors is that I buy for. So I, you know, I'm a nerd. I, I go to the length to subscribe to the RSS feed that is relevant to knowing when there's a, a version change that's relevant to me and that I care about. Um, a lot of it though, for me is also just isolating the devices such that they can only do so much damage if compromised. And that's really like maybe one step removed from your average, average guy, which is having different levels of isolation on your network based on what type of device it is, right? So I'm going to place a higher level of trust on um, having a laptop that's regularly getting updated with Windows that has some type of security software on it than I am like my garage door opener, right? Um, my garage door opener doesn't need access to my home network. It doesn't need access to other devices on my network. All it really needs is an internet connection. And all that really needs is a specific internet connection to 
whatever the cloud enabled services for that device, right? So one really easy way to start isolating these devices further is not only segment them from your logical networks internally, but also limit what websites that IoT device can talk to, right? For example, um, if you buy a, I don't know, like an Amazon smart plug, right? It shouldn't need to talk to anything else except amazon.com and maybe some related domains, right? It shouldn't need to go out to google.com or anything like that. But you could see a world where if an attacker compromised that device, they might try to use that device to go to who knows what kind of internet site or resource, right? So by having that level of isolation and tenancy between your devices, you can impact any potential mitigation that's incurred by um, not having the right firmware on the device or the latest firmware. But again, yeah. what's the no, average guy solution that teaches yeah. folks VLANs and network isolation? I don't really know. Um, one of the obvious ones to me for the average guy is when you buy your wireless access point, almost all of them now come with multiple, multiple radios. Um, and in particular, a lot of the devices come with a set of like, hey, here's your 2.4 gigahertz network, here's your five gigahertz network, and then here are your guest networks, right? Um, a lot of people don't like setting up the guest networks because it seems redundant, right? Like, oh, I already have a 5G network, I don't need another 5G network. Well, the nice thing about the guest network is that most routers implement that by putting it, A, on a completely different subnet and IP range, and B, um, not allowing a route into the guest network from your home network and vice versa. So it really acts as nothing more than a access point out to your ISP so that you can get internet. That that kind of guest network is a great place to put your internet of things devices because let's say you have like a file share that lives in your private network, like your internet of things device should never need to talk to that device. Um, so you're providing yourself a level of boundary access there. Um, and then further, maybe if you're like average guy plus plus, and instead of your regular, um, gateway or home device, you have like a PF sense box. Well, now I know that my private guest network is in this IP range. Well, maybe now I can add a blacklist or a drop list to that range that only has 10 websites allowed. And they're the websites of my, um, internet of things vendors in order to, use those devices properly. You do run a risk though, because you don't always know the vendors may have third party sites they've connected to that they're using for some of those updates. And of course you block them. Then it, it, you know, you wonder why this thing doesn't work. And I think that's again, not average guy, right? You're, yeah. you're deploying a non-average guy uh, solution and you may get hung up. Wow. Why does, why does this doorbell not do what it's supposed to do? Well, you've blocked one of the sites it, it needs access to because the vendor uh, created a really weird site associated with it. So, yeah, it gets um, it gets super. It gets really a lot more difficult in those scenarios where you really want to ensure. I haven't even. I mean, I think of the proliferation of IoT devices in the house. I was just pulling up my Bitdefender central, you know, kind of control panel, which shows me everything that's going through the network. And all of a sudden I'm like, holy crap, There's, I've had a lot of things on my network over the last 100 and, you know, 20, 150 days. And, um, you know, it, it, uh, it begs to, I mean, I, there's a lot of devices on here. So, yeah. 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 Well, and you know, the productized version of this, or even the geeky version of this is you don't know what all those devices are connecting to right away. But the way to do that is when you start with a blank empty guest network and you put one device on and it's a complete blacklist, you should be able to get a log file of all the things it attempted to go to. Right. And so, um, a productized version of this would say, I stand up the new network. I plug in all my IOT devices to it. I allow 30 minutes for all of these devices to phone home to whatever sites that they use to initialize and get set up, et cetera. And then once those devices are humming along for 30 minutes, I move it into enforcement mode, which means anything that was caught in the log becomes a part of the whitelist. And then anything subsequent that I see is, is blacklisted until someone goes in and approves it. Yeah. Um, that way, like if magically your device started using a new 
domain that you're not aware of, chances are your your box got maybe auto updated in a way or got a new feature enabled that you're not even aware of, right? So it can also become an alerting mechanism for you to understand how your devices are changing over time when you may not otherwise know it. For example, like who knows how many times I've had a firmware update on my Echo, right? I'm not sitting there counting. I don't watch when the ring goes and reboots itself, right? Like chances are that thing's done dozens of firmware updates that I haven't tracked, but but I would I would know if there was some major pivotal shift based on what it was reaching out to, sure. Or mm -hmm. maybe I installed an Alexa skill, you know, a week ago that uses a new site and, you know, now it's obvious that yeah, it's going to reach out to its own service for for that skill to work right yeah but for sites for for devices that are not as complex as that where it's more like i'm a smart plug or i'm a garage opener like those types of connections should really not be changing that often right yeah. like yeah. a garage opener is a garage opener it's also not a kitchen spoon or a or a refrigerator so yeah, but on some of these devices, I mean, they've got they've added so many features to them, and like you said, they're updating them fairly regularly. And you do want them to take the updates because some of those can be critical. And it, what we've done, I mean, we've taken the Windows update process and we've now we've migrated it out to a bunch of IoT devices that we don't have any visibility to. They're doing it without us seeing, without us knowing. Yeah, but, but Microsoft has so much to learn from the Internet of Things because I have yet to see an Internet of Things update that went wrong. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. They, they continuously roll them out and improve them, but it's not like a major start from ground zero if an update goes bad. Not as complicated either, just to be honest. I mean, yep. not, not, I mean you're, you're talking about completely different you know, oh, yeah. lines of code and complexity it doesn't have oh, to yeah. be that way. I mean, there's a there's a lot of legacy inside of Windows that that makes it that way. Um, we don't see, we don't necessarily see that. I mean, every Android update hasn't been the best. Every iPhone update has its problem. Not everyone. Some of them have had their problems. But yes, yeah. I mean, certainly from a but but that being said, Christian, you know, you don't. These things are basically doing updates in the clear without us even knowing what's going on with them. And shoot, you don't know. I mean, Chrome is updating itself so frequently now. It's all behind the scenes. You have no idea what it's doing, um, what it's introducing, what's coming in there. We And we don't want to know. It's too complex to kind of keep track of door sensors and cameras. And, you know, we, we had these guys from Hubitat on uh, the show two weeks ago, and they basically... You know, they basically make this hub that's kind of a universal hub that allows you to plug that in. And then you can write, it, it connects all these disparate devices that, did, you know, yes, they have hubs too, but this is kind of brings them all into one. Well, now I've introduced another, another thing, right? Yeah. A thing to rule them all. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it gets pretty, I think it gets pretty complicated. I, there have been times when I thought, oh, it'd really be nice to have a fill in the blank. And then I'm like, God, do I want to manage another IoT right. device? You know? So um, you had, as, as we think about wrapping this up, you had uh, strangely put, because you're not a big Facebook fan, but you had strangely <laughs> put in the notes a weird segue into Facebook reputation damage. Why do you care? Well, I, I continue to count the the foreshadowings of, of Facebook's slow descent into, into their reputational world. Um, and this had come out last month and I just never got a chance to talk about it. And somewhere in my head, it was all related to tonight's conversation. And I'm not quite sure that that train uh, has stayed in the station. It may have left early, um, but a really interesting poll. It basically, it's a annual Harris poll that measures reputation across the hundred most visible companies and from 2018 to 2019 facebook dropped over um 30 positions into 94th out of 100 um meaning that like they're only more trustworthy than uh oh, let's see what were the bottom bottom feeders here and they're actually kind of funny it made me laugh um if you head over th this will be in the show notes by the way it's 
it's a permanent permanent link off of the harrispoll.com it's called the axios harris 100 um and if you expand the table uh the top three most reputable brands were wegmans amazon and patagonia um and the bottom three least reputable were the trump organization philip morris and the u.s government so um pretty fascinating <laughs> that's list. brutal that is pretty brutal. brutal pretty pretty fascinating yeah um but you know it, it when we talk about where facebook has come and gone um in comparison to if you look at the line chart right in 2015 facebook was at 75 then in 16 they were around it looks to be around 60 then 65 then 50 in 2018 if we jump back further to 2013 and 2014 facebook was in the 40 to 45 range so this paints a really interesting story of even despite the tumultuous kind of roadmap facebook had in 2017 and 18 as i was worrying about facebook hit its second highest score since this measurement starting in 2013 in the year 2018 right so i i haven't dug in to see if this is based on i'm assuming it's the rolling average of the last year's 365 days right so when we say facebook Facebook is 94 in the year 2019. Well, that should be based on 2018's data, right? So when we see Facebook hitting 50 in the year 2018, that's really based on 2017's data. Um, so this kind of lines up pretty well with the repeated worldview of where we've been heading with sites and services that can't earn the trust of their customers. Um, and with respect to Facebook having do after do over after do over after do over, it's really starting to show in the numbers. Um, and, and it's interesting because like they're in a whole league of bottom feeders of their own in comparison to the other uh, big fang stocks of uh, Netflix, Apple, Google, Amazon, um, which are all somewhere between two and 41 this year, right? If you were to compare these companies by market cap they're all in the same range of market cap for kind of for the most part netflix is in a little bit of a different world um but but the fact that facebook is still competitive from a market cap perspective but not competitive from a reputation standpoint tells me that there's huge risk for companies that look like this going forward um it also tells me that um the average american is becoming much more aware of the services that they use and this is something that i've been talking about for a long time is what is the actual reputational awareness of the consumer um, because without consumer awareness these numbers just don't matter because they'll never be impacted and corporate culture and direction will never shift if the consumer isn't educated and then advocated for and on behalf of um, so this data does tell me that kind of the predictions we've been talking about when it comes to privacy implications of these technologies is really starting to show in the data. Um, I'm going to start moving this prediction set a little bit further, which is that we're now starting to read more and more cultural articles about people who want to get off of the internet, off of the smartphone, like they're ready to unplug. And I think we had always kind of that's not a new idea um certainly not a new idea like i want to be very clear that there's plenty of people who have who have said that they're disconnected they don't want to be connected etc cetera, etc cetera. but now we're seeing people who were those hyper connected users who are getting fatigued and burned out um or who are getting leery of the reputational implications or moreover and this one is really I think what hits the nail on the head for me, how are the services providing value to their customers? Like age old question, right? I can't answer anymore what value a social media platform like Facebook provides to me, right? When people bought into the concept of Facebook, there was a lot of value that people could rattle off quickly. 
very quickly. Uh, I can immediately stay connected with my families and friends. I now have a way to communicate with them regularly when email just wasn't working. Now I can share all those pictures from Bobby's football game that just, I didn't know how to get out over email because it's a 10 gigabyte or 10 megabyte file size limit. Um, and, and the list just went on and on. Then it was the games, then it was the in ad experiences, then it was the, you know, there was just this whole culture of the customer could rattle off immediately. Here's the top 10 ways that this service is enhancing my life. Now we're getting to a point where there are so many options for how we can choose to be interconnected. The value proposition for any one of them is starting to go down, I think. Um, I, I, I believe while we are still on a trend of becoming more interconnected in society and using devices more, we are also on a trend where we're becoming more likely to start disengaging from social. I think we're actually starting to hit that saturation point in a very real and tangible way. Um, and I'll start continuing to look for data for this because I think I now see enough data about some of the reputational suggestions I've been making on the show that it's time to start exploring some new hypotheses. And my latest one is that the device culture and the device consumerism will continue to rise. Um, I've seen some articles that suggest people want to go back to flip phones in larger numbers than before and not be on the smartphone and not be on the screens. But ultimately, I believe that because, because those devices also serve a dual purpose of being productivity devices, um, it is much more going to be a part of the fabric of the economy than just a social media service in and of itself. Um, so as that paradigm shift expects to, you know, as I expect that to take place, um, we may be starting to see an opportunity for more small new players in town to get into disruptive spaces with these devices, meaning like the devices and the platforms are definitely, definitely way more mature than they were five years ago. Um, and I think when we talk about how are people unplugging or getting disengaged from the internet or from social media, it's it's exactly that. It's the type of content they're choosing to get unplugged from, not necessarily the fact that they're going to go cold turkey 100%. Um, and I think this will have very interesting security and privacy implications moving into 2020 that are yet to be fully realized. And I think it was somewhat related Ah, the train has returned to the station. It was related to this topic because, you know, we were talking about what are the ways that I would reduce my surface area in dealing with all these stale logins of stuff I just don't use anymore. And it got me to thinking, well, crap, there's a lot of stuff we just don't use anymore. Um, and I think those big name brands are now at that same level of risk, right? Where um, you have to be more than just a social platform to survive past 10 years is kind of the data here. Um, classic example out of all of this that I think is a, is a data point, right? I I'm, I'm waiting. There's, I'm sure there's counter data that can disprove some of these assertions, but Google, Google is a classic case study in this theory I'm putting forward, right? Think about it. Big platform, huge presence and pervasiveness into the connectivity of our lives, huge influencer in how we see and perceive information. Um, and yet notice what happened with Google. They launched a social capability in their suite of services, Google Plus. It had a five-year run. It was kind of an also-ran social media platform. It had some loyal followers and foot soldiers, but ultimately... Google decided to kill it and noticed there was no major drop off in Google stock. There was no major hissing and scratching. It was a social platform that came, had a natural life cycle and died. And what does that say about what Google is offering folks as a service? It's the fact that there's that productivity element linked to it, right? The productivity of having my own personal email and email services, of being to collaborate with people over Google Docs. Like tell me another place where I can go get a Google Docs-like capability without being 
an entire pane to use it, right? Um, I can watch videos. I can create content with Google Hangouts. I can read the news, right? They they have so many services that align more to personal productivity. I think that is the catalyst for where we will see growth in the 2020 connectedness of the world. And I think the original forecast that, you know, the boom of the internet was going to be all about social interconnectivity and connecting worlds and making them smaller. Sure, that's a very important facet and a very important element, but I think the productivity horses are going to win it in the long haul. Um, and we're seeing this with a lot of different places. So I think even had Facebook not had the level of reputational damage that it had, it is plausible that it only would have slown its same natural life cycle as a social media company. Because I think there is that kind of like when we talk about what's the one product versus the one to end product, um, I think social media is in that it's past the number one. It's somewhere in that end set of iterations. And these companies will continue to compete for market share and continue to drive interest. And they're not going away, but they're not the hyper growth platform that's pushing the frontier of what the internet can do. And I think look to the look to the services that are providing productivity capabilities and making my life easier. And I think when you when you distill it down to those two things, social media has stopped making people's lives easier. It started to make people's lives harder in many respects. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when it stopped becoming a productivity tool. As soon as social media started making people's lives more complicated and harder, um, that's when it reached its saturation point. Um, and that's the subject of this evening's yeah. Uh, yeah, wow. privacy hypothesis. Nice. Well, you know, and I think, you know, the, the interaction I have with Facebook now is all professional and it's all inside of groups, which are stripped out of their, you know, the advertising and the, 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 the selective showing and the, the kind of the trickery, which has gone on on Facebook. Um, those don't exist in groups for the most part. And so whether it's, our group here the, for the average guy TV or the groups I have at, at Gallup, by the way, I have dozens of customers asking me every year, can we move off of Facebook? Can we get this onto something else? And we will move. Um, Facebook's just so convenient to do it from a group settings. Uh, from a trend perspective, I'm seeing my children are, they, they don't, um, they're not posting. I mean, we have a family chat on Facebook messenger again, doesn't contain the advertising, doesn't right. contain the, the craziness, right? But I get way more snaps from them than I get anything else anymore. They're not posting on Instagram. They're not posting on Facebook. They're not posting on Twitter. Yeah. They're, they're snapping them to me. A very personal experience, right? It's there. It's gone. It's yep. not, the, the longevity's not there. The, it's kind of the, inten the intended. Now, in some ways, I'm disappointed because there's some great pictures in there we never see again. Now, I they're imagine they're on their phone and maybe they'll make their way to Facebook or we need it. For a while there, it was super convenient to kind of have all the pictures in one place because for a decade, you can get pictures of, I get family pictures from the kids and such off their sites fairly easily. That's getting harder to do with, with more and more people kind of leaving that platform. Um, I think that could go very, very fast. Uh, Facebook could, I mean, it's it's already showing large cracks in the distrust in the consumer space. Um, all something would have to do is come along that was even close to providing some of the value that Facebook used to provide. Um, I, I think there could be a mass a mass movement and within a couple of years, they could be irrelevant. They'd still be there. I mean, MySpace is still there for God's sakes, but... Yeah. But um, some of those things are still, I think at Dig, I mean, Dig was one of the biggest sites on the planet at one point in time. You say Dig to anybody in their 20s and they go, what? Who? Like, wh who? Yeah. And so, you know, it's um, it's interesting how fast those things can go. I would have, Christian, if I, five years ago, I would have said, no way. They're, they're, they're here for the long haul. Man, they have made so many mistakes. Uh, in the last couple years, I don't know. Be interesting to see. Again, it's tough to unwind everybody from that, but man, that could go 
super fast. I don't post at all like I used to on Facebook. Like I was, mm -hmm. I posted when I traveled. I posted pictures of where I was going. I wanted to show great things. Now I post pictures of me and my mom. That's because she's on there and that'll make her feel good. Right. And yeah. so I take, when I do selfie, I take, you know, most of those are me and my mom. Yeah. So it's a, it's a completely different world. And um, it'll be interesting to see where this goes for sure. Anything else you want to say before I wrap it? No, I think that's a wrap for tonight. All right. We, we got it done. I'll remind everyone that uh, this platform, the average guy.tv, by the way, if you haven't been out to the site in a while, I changed the uh, theme, uh, made it a little more efficient. Uh, loads super fast. It loads super fast, mostly because Christian is a wizard in what he does. And so, uh, Maple Grove Partners, of course, behind this, and and a little bit of Gary too. Gary, thanks for the work that you do there to make the hardware great. Uh, if you are interested in getting some kind of hosting, especially WordPress specific, Christian's really great at that. Get uh, high speed, reliable hosting from people that you know. That's just sitting right across from me here. Maple Grove Partners. Dot com. Oh, we mentioned we welcome your questions. And if you want to send them to us, Jim at TheAverageGuy.tv, Christian at TheAverageGuy.tv. You can send me a tweet if you want, uh, at Jay Collison. Christian, that's another one of those Twitter where you think, eh, I don't know, it's kind of it's kind of done its thing. There's some very avid groups on Twitter. Like, I mean, oh yeah, it definitely has its place. And I have conversations over there. Um, I've We've been on the Discord, on the Discord server now yeah, for, I don't my, know. One of my favorite things social yeah. wise is Discord now. No, pretty great. The average guy.tv slash Discord will get you there. Christian's out there and uh, you want to communicate. And we do have a Cyber Frontiers channel. And then mm. we've got things like fitness and crypto, well, crypto and barbecue. Who doesn't, who doesn't like barbecue? We got some gaming, some unraid, some home networking. Basically, the admins, if conversation in the general section gets a theme, they'll just make a new channel for it. So, Head out to the average guy.tv slash discord and a lot of great stuff going on over there. Absolutely no advertising or no shenanigans that I know of. Could could shenanigans begin to happen on Discord, Christian, from what you know of it? It seems pretty sure it's possible, mm. but it's not um there's different realms of shenanigans. I don't know. It doesn't yeah. seem as <laughs> open as other platforms yeah. I've used. Yeah, maybe the maybe the user base is smarter, so the the, the shenanigans aren't as easy to get uh, to get across. I don't know. It seems yeah. the barrier to entry seems harder to get in. Like Discord would not, in my mind, is not necessarily an average guy. It's like it would cater more towards the Reddit folks as than it would the yeah. Facebook folks, right? That's fair. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Reddit that's another one. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dun, dun, That's dun. a whole other shit show over there. Yeah. So we um, we are live when we feel like it. And so Christian and I get together and get this done mostly Monday nights. And we try to go every other week, but sometimes it goes farther. If you're still listening to this on the recorded version of it, thanks for doing that. Thanks for not unsubscribing after we're gone for six weeks. It just happens. That's this. It's this kind of podcast. We like to think we got some great stuff and uh, we appreciate you staying around for it. We'll be back next time with some more great stuff, just like this stuff. Thanks for listening. Thanks for coming out live. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody. Good night.